Ms. Parks, thank you so much for coming to speak to us tonight. I really appreciate your courage and your bravery. And as you were speaking, a question came to mind. I was curious to what you'd say to those people who have fears, um, maybe, maybe not here, mm -hmm. but for future who might be worried about the retributions that come from speaking out and for standing for what they believe in. How do you reason with that, especially when those attacks can be targeted to your family and your mm -hmm. friends? How did you deal with it, and what would you recommend to those facing similar situations? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I know that what the, <laughs> the, the vengeance of the mainstream media is like. <laughs> uh, when I spoke out against the woke and the, the sympathizers of socialism, I was like literally canceled by FBI. Like literally I was invited to speak at FBI, and then the day before my event, the head of diversity at FBI calls me. You know that's a job, right? Head of diversity. And this lady calls me saying she has canceled the event because of my political opinions. And there are actual consequences currently in America standing up for your beliefs. But as I said, because of these consequences right now, losing your job, called as a racist and conspiracy theorist, next time when you stand up, it's going to be the three generations of your family's life. So, if we keep, this is the thing, when I come to America, the first question that I was asked by people was like, are North Koreans stupid or something? <laughs> Why there's no revolution? 80 years, same three fat Kim dictators been ruling. Not single one revolution is happening. What's wrong with you guys? Because of it, they go after eight generations of your, your family. And I think because of that, even though it's scary, this is a time to stand up. So we don't ever get to that point like North Koreans are. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeon me, I wanted to uh, tell you what a brave woman you are. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I think you're the bravest woman in the 21st century. <laughs> thank to you. To have written the book in order to live and to be honest and to tell all these people and to tell the whole world about the brutality and the cruelty and the horrible things that are happening in North Korea. Thank and I you, want sir. you to also know that I know that your father, your deceased father, is standing here by you, and he's cheering you on, because you are a very, very brave woman. Thank and I you. I also want to ask you what you think of crossing borders, and how we, as free people here in this room, can help the North Korean refugees who are the 330,000 or more <laughs> refugees who are stuck in China. Oh, thank you. I think, so it's one thing to be a sex slave in China and another thing to be a sex slave in America, right? And that's been happening. So over the last year, several years, the Chinese human traffickers are flying these girls to Mexico and then smuggling them in through the southern border to America. And they have created these brothers in California and around the country. And these North Korean girls, they don't speak English. They were so brainwashed by these human traffickers that they think American policy is also dangerous. So now, the human trafficking that was happening in China is spread to America. And I think it's going to take us to stand up for this lawlessness. And also, first of all, that we have to go after China. Because China sponsors dictatorship in North Korea. North Korea is run by CCP. That's the thing. Somehow we accuse Kim Jong-un for every problem, but Kim Jong-un cannot operate North Korea even one week without CCP's help. So the only way we can liberate North Korean people is holding China accountable, telling them don't sponsor dictatorship, and letting these sex slaves in China because North Korean defectors are not like any other refugees in the world. They have a nation willing to accept them as their citizens, South Korea. So South Korean constitution says anybody were born in Korean Peninsula are South Koreans. 
So if North Koreans just go to South Korea, they become Koreans automatically. And that's what we are asking of China. It's not like we are asking them to accept us as refugees or giving us status. Just don't catch us. Let us go through so we can go to South Korea. But even that, China is not cooperating. I think for that little demand, we can make as an international society. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, incredible book, very brave. Um, I was uh, touched reading uh, the accounts of the trafficking in North Korea. <laughs> and I've, I've met similar people that have gone through that, you know, really unfortunate wives um, that, you know, can't go anywhere else. Um, a lot of us here are uh, college students graduating soon. And so I'm wondering, um, is there any organizations we can join, like Liberty in North Korea, to uh, help uh, not only sex slaves, but also just uh, political uh, refugees, uh, farmers in mm -hmm. North Korea that are in China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there are missionaries are still risking their lives and rescuing North Koreans. So if anybody interested in uh, rescuing uh, operation, please let me know. But not only the rescuing project is happening when it comes to helping North Korean people, there are information campaign. So do you guys remember during the Germany, uh, West East Germany, West Germany, they were sending leaflets to spread information. So because North Korea does not have internet, we have an organization in South Korea, we send the leaflets to North Korea through DMZ. And in the leaflets, we tell them that Kim Jong-un goes bathroom. He's a dictator. <laughs> you know, the Americans are not bastards. <laughs> There's lots of food outside the world, you know. So this kind of information is so important to wake up North Korean people's eyes. Because we need to free their minds first, right? This is what, when I learned about freedom. There's a, two types of dictatorships. Number one is physical dictatorship, we know. Like they literally physically not giving you passport and detain you and control your physics, like body. Second dict dictatorship is way more important and is way more sneaky. It's called dictatorship of the mind, emotional dictatorship. That's what North Korea mastered it. They control what people think. And I think a lot of this dictatorship of the mind is happening in America too, but North Korean people are not even free to think. That's why this information is really important. Even when the day North Korea gets liberated, we don't want them to think that America is a horrible country, right? So sending this leaflet is so crucial to opening their eyes to, to see the rest of the world. Yeah, so there are NGOs that I can connect you guys to if anybody want to be a volunteer or want to do the rescue, any of it. There's so many NGOs working on this issue. Thank you. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd actually be very interested in that. If you... Awesome. Thank you. Let's connect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. First of all, um, I would like to thank you for your wonderful speech today. Thank you. Uh, I'm from South Korea. Oh. And as someone who was born and raised in South Korea, I've always been told about the division of my country and then mm -hmm. I've always been dreaming for the day for you know, Korean Peninsula to become one again. Mm -hmm. And in order to, for that day to come, it will be crucial, to, it will be essential for North Korea to be freed first. Mm -hmm. And as always, freedom is not free, right? So right. that is why I always believe that um, freedom of North Korea should be done by the hand of North Korean people. Mm -hmm. And how would you evaluate the possibility of North Korean people themselves rising up, rise up for the freedom and overthrew the dictatorship. I mean, like, South Korea was also under dictatorship at some point, but then like, it was democratized by the people, right? Mm -hmm. So will there be any possibility of the revolution happen in North Korea? So that's a great question. Like, what's the possibility of North Koreans rising up and demanding their freedom? Uh, as somebody who lived there, it's a... Like when I came to, when I went to Colombia, I was really interested because my classmates were telling me how they are oppressed. You know, <laughs> they are so oppressed because they identify themselves with the 10 different thousand ways and we are not quite catching up with their pronouns. 
<laughs> so I was like, that's interesting that you know that you're oppressed because when you're actually oppressed, you don't know you're oppressed. That is the definition of the oppression. So in North Korea, people don't know they are, they are enslaved. So if you don't know you're a slave, how do you fight to be free? And I think that's why it's so hard with North Korea because people don't even know they're oppressed. So I think if we help them to understand oppression and sending these leaflets and waking them up, maybe one day they will understand their situation and demand justice. So that's why I guess we got to help them. <laughs> and we at least have to pray for them. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I first want to say hello, Ms. Park, and thank you for coming here. I watched a lot of your videos on YouTube and uh, subscribe to your channel. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> but I also wanted to let you know that um, I'm a homeless and a mental health person in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question for you is, uh, what type of treatment would a person like me get in North Korea? And uh, how many people are uh, mentally ill and homeless in North Korea? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, this is a big passion of mine because when I came to America, I I fell in love with this country because I could not believe there was like on the elevators there were like little dots below. I was like I asked them what is this? It's like they're to assisting people who cannot see. There are so many ways that people help, but in North Korea, if you are disabled, <laughs> they exile you from capital first of all, and they put you in an institution. So if you're a dwarf, they send you a dwarf village and you cannot procreate again. Uh, and a lot of them are gone in the institution and we, don't, we never hear from them and families can never visit them again. So they do not believe in human, human dignity in any way. So a lot of them, there's no chance of you becoming a homeless. That's the thing. When people are saying, oh, there are homeless in America, how evil is it? And when I came here, I was like thinking, like, what do you mean that you have a right not to work? Because <laughs> in North Korea, there's no such a thing. You cannot not work. Governments are going to ascend your job. So they literally going to send you a work camp. And of course, you know, America is not perfect, but that's the thing. Like in real actual socialism, there's no ch chance of you choosing your own fate. And, and I, I'm going to pray for you. So thank you so much for your courage to come today. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. I love you. I think you're fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeb Jacoby. I am a history major from Massachusetts. Uh, I just wanted to say I have studied the history of North Korea extensively. Uh, I've read into it when it was originally a unified nation. The Japanese came in in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. They took control of it. Uh, the Americans, uh, towards the end of the war, came in from the south. The North, uh, Russians came in from the top and it divided and which le thus led to the Korean War. Mm -hmm. And what I was kind of, when I was listening to your speech, which was fantastic by the way, uh, the similarities to the things that you were describing to what the Japanese did to the Korean people during the 1930s and the 1940s, mm -hmm. like how would you describe the, in, the social and like mental impact on the people in Korea during that time? In North Korea or Yes, yeah, in North Korea. Oh. I mean, so when I was writing my first book, In Order to Live, uh, I was writing with the Penguin Random House. It's a great publisher. They know how to take care of their writers. And my editor was saying, like, Yomi, you have PTSD. <laughs> you need to go <laughs> therapy. <laughs> so I was like, what's therapy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, it's a place where you go and talk about how hard it was and talk about your emotions. And at the time, it was really interesting to me. Like, if I'm in a place to talk about how hard it was, right. I don't need a therapy. Like, I'm in a <laughs> great place, right? Uh, it's just like that. So the idea of mental health or PTSD or therapy, the, that kind of concept doesn't exist in North Korea. Like, you are a revolutionary. 
Your only purpose in life is dying for serving for the party and the dear leader. No other things possible in your life other than that, serving the nation, and individuals don't matter. So those kind of concept is a the first world concept. <laughs> it's just <laughs> how I how I saw that place. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, but yeah, so most of North Koreans don't even know what that is, and there's no even word for stress. Damn. When I came to America, there was people saying, like, I'm so stressed, like, what do you mean? Because in North Korea, like, how can you be stressed if you are living in a socialist paradise, right? right. You cannot be. So yeah. governments does not give you the word to understand what stress is. <laughs> So I learned so many new concepts when I came to America. <laughs> That's fantastic. If it were up to me, I'd, no I'd nominate you for the Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, thank so. you. <laughs> You're so kind. Thank you so much. <laughs> if you could say one thing to the political leaders of the West, pick one at random, Joe Biden, what would you say? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm not like, what is the one thing I would say? Um, it seems, I guess it's a thing now, America was a very religious country when it was founded upon, and they were serving God. They were answering to God, not to their own personal interest. And I see both sides in America. All the politicians are fighting for their personal interest. And I think that's why it's just a good thing for us not to trust them. <laughs> I don't <laughs> expect Biden to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a. We, if we can avoid them, we can avoid them, but we need the government to keep us safe, right? That's their job, keeping us from the foreign invasion and from the criminals, all of that. But they're feeling it right now. <laughs> uh, I think that's the thing where I don't expect them to behave morally in any sense. They're people, and they're going to fight for their interests. That's why it's so important for us to stay vigilant and keeping them on check and so they don't going to sell our country for their own benefit. And that's why I don't even expect him to be a good person at this point. So thank you, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Miss <laughs> Park, thank you very much for your bravery. Thank um, you. And uh, I'm, I'm a black conservative. I love this country. I love the Constitution. And I'm dismayed because we're at a point in our history where we're losing our First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. We're losing our Second Amendment rights. Um, I'm LDS. I served my mission in a, in a, a formerly communist country. So I, I've seen, though I didn't live during that time, what comes of that. Mm -hmm. And I am so dismayed that my generation and those younger are afraid to speak up mm -hmm. because they think they're going to be called racist as if, and I love what you said, we're, we're, God gave us these freedoms. They don't come from the state it, and it's colorless. Mm -hmm. What can you say further than what you've already said to inspire my lovely brothers and sisters here of a lighter shade mm -hmm. that think that they let people think that it's racist to love America and love the Constitution. What more can you say to them to inspire them to speak out because we really are at a crossroads in this country. We're about to lose our freedoms. I, I think you are the answer to that question. Like you prove that freedom is colorless. I think that's why they hate people like you and me or Candace Owens when, as a minority, when we say that white people are not racist, they are like, they, they have nothing else to add other than, oh, you're a CIA spy, <laughs> right? For me, they're like, okay, so what, what else can I say? Oh, she's a liar, she's a CIA spy. Uh, I think we need more people like you. I think that's all I say. We need more people like you to prove that this country does not have systemic racism. There are personal racism. So look, just go to Korea, go to Japan. That racisms are everywhere. We are never gonna get rid of that. But there is currently no systemic racism in America. And I hope more people like you and all of us to really show them that's not the case. 
and I'm so inspired by you. So thank you so much for sharing your story, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
and then we are telling them they are victims. Like, how on earth? Their grandparents went through so unimaginable that's slavery. They thrived in that. And now we are telling this young generation of African Americans they are the victims. They deserve uh, government's handouts, right? And I think just like that, it's, it, we can tell them, I think, sorry that you went through something horrific, but I think it's Im important for these survivors to realize what they can achieve because they are so strong, because of what they have survived. I don't know, it's, I'm sure it's a very unusual thing, but at least that's what helped me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Parks, for coming out and speaking to us. I know that's, um, it was pretty hard to hear your story, but it does inspire a lot of people, especially people I know that um, were also, um, a few were sex slaves, and mm -hmm. so it, I know it's kind of hard to uh, go through that. And so I just want to say thank you for speaking to us, um, and I know it's hard. I do, uh, sorry, I do have a question. How do we uh, connect if we want to volunteer? Well, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> it's, you know, bird is free, so. <laughs> uh, and YAF can connect us. YAF okay. has my contact. And yeah, there are many ways, so Twitter or YAF. And I would love to connect you, any of you want to be involved in this movement and fighting for America or fighting for North Korean people or anything. Please, let's get connected and do this together. I mean, nobody can do this alone, right? Yeah. So. I'm so grateful that I've met all of you and you made your time to come see me and hear my speech so we can work together. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Park, thank you for being here and uh, thanks for all the good you do in the world. Uh, my name is Jason Walton and mm -hmm. my question is I heard you mention how when you read the Constitution, mm -hmm. Is the first time you realized that there were rights that you had from God mm -hmm. that weren't given to you by the government. Yeah. And I was hoping you could share with us what some of those rights are. Oh, I mean, <laughs> there are so many other rights the Constitution says, but I think what struck me when I read the Constitution for the first time that, you know, my existence, my worth came from government in North Korea, how they recognized me. But in America, my right as a person does not come from that. It's above that. And I think that's why the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution is so unique in that way. And that's why we are, we are even protected from all our own government's tyranny. Another right that I love in the U.S. Constitution is the right to bear arms. It's a, it's a lot of people saying that, like, this is why I believe in America, because we have guns. And hear me out, I know a lot of you are get triggered right now. <laughs> I know there are school shootings, I know there are, like, but, so people are saying like, well, Obama has nukes, right? They, at the time I came, the Obama was the president, it's like, you know, how with a single gun, how are you gonna fight against your government? Is that there is no way your government will kill all of you. Then how they're gonna become a dictator? How are they gonna enslave? And imagine if North Korean people had the guns in their hands. Who's on earth going to let three generations of your family get taken down and get killed? You're going to fight back in some way. Look at Hong Kong. 75% of people in Hong Kong marched on the street demanding their freedom from CCP. Because they did not have a single gun in their hand, that didn't matter. The majority didn't want it. They still gone that way. So because of that, it's so important for us to keep that guns in our hands. And when the day comes, hopefully never, but if our government becomes our slave, like our owners, right, like, like a North Korean regime, then we can use that gun to free ourselves. And I think that is the most important right that I see besides all other rights that I see in the Constitution. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right, everyone, just by the way, this will be our last question. Oh, wait, we've already done our last question. Sorry, everybody. There's two more questions. Yay! Sorry, don't listen to me at all. Okay, two more questions. Thank you, for, so, thank you so much for your presentation. It was, you, you said so many important things. So my name is Bogdan. I'm mm -hmm. from Ukraine, yeah. and I was born 20 years past the uh, collapse of Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And 
even though I didn't live under the communism, mm -hmm. I've seen the consequences of communism. Right. Uh, even though there is democracy in the system, people still have socialism in their heads. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, uh, I feel that when I moved here mm -hmm. in the, to the U.S., I, I was shocked that a lot of people <laughs> like seriously believed that they need socialism in this country. Yeah, it, it was wild for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that w what you do is incredibly important to remind the people here that um, there are actually, as you said, the last hope. Like if if the U.S. will f fall, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have a very dystopian future. Yeah. And um, I just wanted to thank you for everything you said and for everything you do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's oh, it's such a Hello. pleasure to meet you. Mm -hmm. um, I just was super excited to hear from you because I studied public health in very, and I'm very passionate about helping women get out of abuse and that sort of situation. Mm -hmm. um, but what really stood out to me as you were speaking was I got kind of choked up when you started talking about motherhood. Mm -hmm. Because I'm actually expecting, I, I'm seven months pregnant, oh. so I'll be meeting my daughter soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, as someone who has um, experienced so many horrific things in your life and is so um, aware of the evil in the world, how have you, um, just mother to mother, how have you instilled hope in your child? Thank you and congratulations, <laughs> what a blessing. Uh, I mean, how I instilling hope in my child is I learned the hard way that in America, parents are super obsessed of giving a good self-confidence to their children. They are so afraid to say no to their children. <laughs> I'm sure it's not in Utah, but in New York. In a way, like saying no is like a death sentence. Like literally parents, like I have literally friends, they don't say no to their dog. Their dog is trash and they throw up, get sick. They say no, no to the dog because they don't want to hurt the dog's feelings. <laughs> this is how far they gone, right? <laughs> but instead of hope, I think that, in a way, for me, that doesn't really, it didn't really matter for me what hope or not. It's like, in a way, what is the right thing to do? Is that my son understands that nothing is free. <laughs> when somebody says it's free, that's a lie, right? There can never be a free things. And letting him understand that education is privilege, it's not a right. Healthcare is a privilege, it's not a right. So really helping him to understand the world early on and not teaching him this entitlement that you need to work for things that you can get it. So uh, instead of like really focusing on painting the bright future my, for my son, I, every day I teach him the values of work and studying hard. I'm an Asian mom, like tiger mom, here I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's asking why do I need to do math? Because that's how you can understand and build things in the future. Right, you have a responsibility to create things for others and work as a human being. So instead of like really focusing on that, I try to teach him the responsibility and discipline. And I think if we all did that with our children, America's future would be so much brighter. If your child identifies whatever that thing is, instead of worrying about trying to get their like confidence up, just like do the right thing. And so they can they don't become like Columbia students where they cannot handle the textbook. I remember before I go into class, my professors are sending us these trigger warning emails. In today's topic, in this reading material, we might deal with slavery, rape, or oppression. If this material triggers you in any way, you don't need to do the reading, you don't need to come to the class, you don't even need to tell me why it triggered you or not coming. It's like, what is the point of education then? Like, literally. So if we do tell our children no early on, I'm sure they are not going to need the trigger warnings later. <laughs> so let's, let's say a lot of no's to our children. So thank you. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank okay. you so much. Thank you, everyone. It was so